um, which is the Francis Scott Key Bridge. Um, a couple of questions around that. Describe your morning when, when you got the phone call and, and, and what that was like. Uh, talk a little bit about what that incident says about you know, both our highway infrastructure and about uh, uh, container shipping uh, and what needs to be fixed. And uh, then tell us uh, the date that the new Francis Scott Key Bridge is coming yeah, to be. Uh, I don't think I'll get to make that news today, but uh, obviously it's something we've been very engaged in from day one. Um, you know, the last thing I do before I go to sleep is uh, turn on the ringer on my work phone. And I remember getting into bed and thinking, did I turn the ringer on? Getting back out of bed, going across the room to the dresser where I put my phone, flicking the ringer on, going back into bed. And then, of course, a few hours later, waking up to, to that uh, news and then the shocking uh, video and image minutes later being on the phone with the White House, with Governor Moore, the mayor, and others. Um, and what I'll say is, is, as horrible as that situation was, it also really brought out the best in people, both in terms of the way the community of Baltimore responded, uh, certainly the, the leadership of, of Governor Moore, but also a lot of different federal agencies working together that haven't always had occasion to do that. Coast Guard, Army Corps of Engineers, us, Department of Labor even involved because of the uh, impact on the jobs of the workers who are in the port. The, the important thing to understand about the Port of Baltimore, even though it was not one of the top three or five container shipping ports. It is uniquely set up to handle vehicle shipping. It's our number one vehicle handling port in the U.S. Uh, so much so that there are facilities on the grounds of the port that actually complete some of the processes of manufacturing cars, some of those finish, finishing touches. Um, and nearly all of the port was blocked by the wreckage of that bridge. Uh, I was just notified today that a 560-ton piece of the bridge has come out of the channel, which is one of the things that uh, most stood in the way of getting a temporary channel that's going to be about 35 feet deep, 280 wide open. That will be an important intermediate step toward getting the full channel open, which the Army Corps hopes is to that, achieve. That's not quite deep enough for container ships? Or? Uh, for the, no. Uh, it depends on the ship. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and ultimately, it'll be down to the Coast Guard to certify uh, what, what will be eligible. Uh, but you really need the full channel open. Yeah. Um, because some of those bigger ships, ships that were bigger than, than what was even contemplated when the, the Francis Scott Key Bridge was built in the 70s, are now routinely going through those channels, the, the, what they now call the Neo Panamax uh, uh, variety of ships, which are uh, built to just barely fit into the uh, Panama mm -hmm. Canal in its newer dimensions. Right. Um, all of which is to say, while it's been a big disruption to shipping in the region, it's remarkable to see how quickly uh, we, we hope that that will be fully back up and running by the end of May. The piece you mentioned, which will take much longer, is getting that, that bridge back. What we know is that the new bridge is going to be different than the old bridge. You, you're not going to build a bridge in the 2020s, according to the state of the art of the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and uh, the original bridge took five years. So it's not going to be something that happens overnight. Uh, it's going to require, I think, a lot of creativity, uh, innovation to, to make it move as quickly as it could uh, without getting into all the, the guts of, of transportation infrastructure procurement. Uh, it will use a process called progressive design build, which is a quicker way to get infrastructure done than traditional models where you have the thing fully cooked and then you go out and start bidding the, the construction of it. What that should enable is a swifter process. Uh, we've already put $60 million out to help with the early stages of that, but uh, that is a fraction of what this is going to cost. Mm. And the president has pledged that the, the federal government will front uh, all of the funding needed to get that up, with, of course, the important caveat that there uh, uh, may and likely will be uh, a process of recovery uh, from any private party that might be held liable. Of course. Thank you. One of the things, I mean, the Biden administration has been extraordinarily productive. One of the things the president has done, doesn't get enough credit for, is taking cabinet agencies that were not often always central mm -hmm. and making them central. I used to work in the Commerce Department, yeah. which of a backwater. Now Gina Raimondo is in mm -hmm. charge of sort of the f cutting edge of, of, of competitiveness. Um, and the Transportation Department is at one of those moments, kind of apogee in its history. Yeah. Uh, under you because you've got this infrastructure bill, parts of the Inflation Reduction Act, that 
essentially have us doing the biggest investment in our transportation infrastructure since the Eisenhower administration. Yep. I think it's up to 51,000 uh, projects now. Yep. And you were just in the Southwest announcing one of the coolest. So maybe yeah. let's start uh, Yeah, yesterday was a great day. Um, uh, we were <coughs> in Las Vegas marking the really the beginning of U.S. high-speed rail in, in many ways. So the Bright Line West project that we celebrated yesterday, we contributed uh, $6.5 billion of loans and grants through the, the President's infrastructure plan. Uh, plans to serve a Las Vegas to Southern California route, and they plan to be open uh, by the end of 2028. So uh, in the uh, second term of the Biden presidency, <laughs> Americans can be uh, in a seat buying a ticket on actual high-speed rail, um, which I think is doubly important. First of all, it's just very exciting that the number of cars that's going to take off the road uh, along a stretch of I-15 that is notoriously congested is, is a win in and of itself. But also, I'm convinced that when that happens, there will be no going back. Because, I mean, so many people travel abroad, and they have that experience of seeing uh, what they have in Japan, for example. I saw that last year when we went out to the G7. We had to take the bullet train to get to, to uh, where our meetings were held with the other transportation ministers. And so many Americans come back thinking, why can't we have nice things, right? You see that. And, and not even a Japanese standard, but, uh, you know, a, 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 a Spanish or, or, or Turkish or, or Moroccan standard of high-speed rail. Uh, they, they're working on this in Uzbekistan. I mean, we should be leading on this, and we haven't been. But now we're, we're getting in the game in a big way. And so instead of having to go to Japan or, or, or somewhere else to see this, I think anybody who comes back from Las Vegas, which is a lot of people from a lot of places in the United States, will say, why can't we have this in the Midwest? Why can't we have this in Texas? Why can't we have this in the Pacific Northwest? And that will create a level of demand and a level of expectation while also creating a level of expertise in the U.S. about how to do this. One of the reasons why it's been so hard, one of the reasons why it's been particularly difficult for the, the other high-speed rail project that's already in construction in earnest, which is the north-south effort in California that's also very much underway, is that we, we haven't done this as a country. We don't have the cadres of, of engineers and project managers and, and, and uh, um, uh, people in industry or government who know what it's like to build and launch uh, a high-speed rail line. Now we will. I don't want to make this political, mm. but don't get me the, in trouble. Uh, the, no, I won't. But the opposition party, mm. they don't seem to mm. like high speed rail. They don't like light rail. They got a problem <coughs> with what, what, what? Why is that? I don't know, but but I'll tell you. Whenever I encounter that, and I do. I often encounter it when I'm testifying on Capitol Hill. Um, I try to respond in terms that I would hope they would appreciate, which is that if you believe that the U.S. ought to lead, if you believe in the U.S. having the best in everything, if you believe that the U.S. Uh, should always aspire to be the greatest country in the world, um, why wouldn't we have the greatest high-speed rail in the world? Uh, why, why should we have uh, inferior service on one of the most important modes of transportation? Another thing that comes up is, is this, this kind of uh, fiction that uh, rail should pay for itself, and because it generally doesn't, uh, it, must, um, it must be inferior, as though uh, driving pays for itself. Of course it doesn't. I mean, there's a huge amount of investment, much of it from us, that goes into making sure that roads and bridges are in good shape. And the economic development you unlock makes it more than a good bet for society. And, and that was even before uh, we knew what the climate implications were, which are also massive and positive uh, for rail. Uh, the other thing I would say, I, mean, I, I read uh, a, uh, I think it came from the Cato Institute of all places, a libertarian or conservative uh, uh, attack, it was either Cato or Heritage, uh, on the principle of rail bemoaning the fact that, uh, uh, and, and, and entering as kind of a critique against high, uh, passenger rail, the fact that, that uh, tickets on the Northeast Corridor on Amtrak were sometimes more expensive than airfares. Now, as a passenger, I would love for it to be as cheap as possible. Um, but if you are a free market type, the fact that people are willing to pay not just the same but more for a train ride than for a plane ride over the same distance should be telling you something that the market is telling you that this is a better way to cover a distance that is, that is either a short plane ride or a long drive. And there are so many city pairs around America, many of them, by the way, in, in so-called red America, that are excellent candidates for high-speed rail because they have precisely this, a pair of cities that is an uncomfortably long drive or a weirdly short flight, uh, and, and therefore would be an excellent, excellent candidate for high-speed rail.
You know, he does this on Fox all the time. He goes on, <coughs> they ask him hard questions, and you've become the master of responding. No, 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 the, the absolute master. But maybe, Mike, well, you have a tough question. Maybe. Uh, um, here's my question, and I think it's a question that uh, is probably on the minds of a lot of people sitting here with us. Uh, a high-speed rail project from Las Vegas to Los Angeles is great. We're all for it. Uh, but what about the Northeast Corridor? Now, I'm going to I'm going to preface this question with a little story. It's you about sound like my boss. <laughs> 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 All right. Well, that's a good thing in this case. Uh, I'm my little story is about the Beatles, and I promise I'm going to make this relevant. I was reading a book a few years ago about the Beatles' first trip to America. They were in New York, of course, at Ed Sullivan, and their first concert was here at what was then called the Washington Coliseum. It's where that REI store is now. Uh, they took a train because it was too snowy for them to fly. And I'm reading along about this, and it mentions their two-hour and 15-minute train ride from New York to Washington. The Acela <laughs> is slower than a 1964 sure. train. Yep. So why and um, when might we see high-speed rail between Washington and New York or Washington and Boston? And how, how much time might a Washington to New York trip someday in our dreams take? So one would hope that we can get it at least back to below the amount of time that it took back then. Uh, part of the answer, not to be flip about it, is that there's, there's more things between uh, uh, those, yeah. those cities than there used to be. Right. Um, and it means anything like, uh, for example, straightening out a curve. The right of way that goes into that goes through some of those complex uh, and expensive real estate in the United States. Right. Um, you add to that some of the legacy issues. Frankly, the, the big challenge we have on the Northeast Corridor before we get to pursuing your and my dream of, of and the President's dream of faster and faster uh, connections up and down the Northeast Corridor is just taking care of what we've got. Uh, we're redoing the Hudson <coughs> River tunnels. Um, hundreds of thousands of, of, of passengers a day count on these tunnels. They represent the <coughs> finest up-to-date engineering of the Roosevelt administration, the Teddy Roosevelt administration. Wow. We're talking about more than 100 years old. And damage compounded by Superstorm Standy meant that they, they are even more compromised. And there was just no way to fund restoring those tunnels. Now, they will be not only restored, but augmented. There's new tunnels, old tunnels. Uh, it's arguably the biggest public course transportation project east of the Mississippi in my lifetime. Um, but that's just to keep what we have going and then add some frequency. The Portal North Bridge, similar. The, the current bridge is a swing bridge, and it doesn't, sometimes it doesn't quite swing exactly all the way, which means they have to come out with sledgehammers to move it fully into alignment. Not optimal for today's Northeast Corridor. Uh, so the solution, obviously, is a bridge with no moving parts that's much higher so that maritime traffic can go under it, which is exactly what we're doing, but it takes about a billion dollars, and uh, the funding just wasn't there. So we've got a state of good repair backlog, but, but the good news is that backlog is finally shrinking rather than growing. Uh, the bad news is it will be a while before we're all the way done with it. Uh, but in the meantime, we are finding even just sometimes 30 seconds here, 30 seconds there, little ways to, to address the trip time and piece by piece are going to make it better and better. Plus, new train sets coming in for the Acela line um, that will also make a difference.